This Artificial Intelligence and Equality podcast is hosted by Carnegie Council Senior Fellow Anya Kasperson. Together with Wendell Wallach and an International Advisory Board, they direct the Carnegie Artificial Intelligence and Equality Initiative, AIEI, which seeks to understand the innumerable ways in which AI impacts equality and international affairs. This episode features Stavros Niarchos Foundation's Stelios Vasilakis being interviewed by Carnegie Council President Joel Rosenthal. It was recorded on January 23rd, 2022. Today, I am joined by Joel Rosenthal and Stelios Vasilakis for an irreverently engaging conversation about the impact of AI on democracy, what we can learn from the Athenian Agora in preserving what it means to be human in the biodigital realm, and how ethics empower civil engagement. Stelios Vasilakis is co-directing programs and strategic initiatives at the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, which is one of the leading international philanthropic organizations. Stelios is also a classics and modern Greek studies scholar specialized in the works of Homer. Joel Rosenthal is president of the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs and a distinguished public intellectual of international relations and foreign policy. Before handing the floor over to Joe to guide us through this conversation, I would like to ask both of you to explain the concepts of empowerment guiding the work of both of your organization. And there's a strong interconnection between the two. For the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, it is about empowering humanity. And for the Carnegie Council, it is about empowering ethics. Let us start with you, Joel, then move on to Stelios before Joel will take this conversation forward. Over to you, Joel. Sure. Well, I think in today's world, we live in a very uh, distrustful world, uh, a world of uh, a, sort of a crowded and overheated uh public space, um, if we can even identify that space, which we're, we've talked about, it's a difficult space to even find. And so what we're trying to do um, at the beginning to empower ethics is first of all, just to identify the issues and to identify these issues, um, put a name on them, label them and show them to be issues of competing values and competing interests that would benefit from reflection, dialogue, and discussion. So that even that, that, that question of identification and clarification of these issues and to bring them to the fore in a way um, that um, will not necessarily lead to polarization but can lead to constructive dialogue. That's the first step. The second step is to provide thought leadership around these questions. Um, there are people who have dedicated their lives to, to thinking about some of these issues, to studying these issues. They have great competence and some authority in speaking about these issues and to identify those people and bring those thought, that thought leadership to bear on these questions. Critically though, it's not just about thinking, it's also about experience. Um, the, there are people who are actually working on these issues. They're working these problems. It's part of their um, personal and professional life. And I think that the experience that they, they have themselves is almost as valuable, if not more valuable than those who spend their lives thinking about these issues and creating scholarship. Around. So when we talk about thought leadership, we're talking about both um, scholarship and lived experience. And, Carnegie Council being a place where we can bring that, that expertise, if you will, um, um, to bear on these questions. The third part is also cr critical today is to create a community of engagement around these issues. Um, the, 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 the public square is hard to find, right? Um, the internet is not a public square as we've discussed. Um, so you cannot assume an audience um, and you cannot um, just, you know, you, you can't just sort of publish and post and convene and whatever. You must proactively create a community of engagement um, around these issues. Uh, and that's a big part of what we're working on now. And then lastly is to create educational resources um, around, around the issue. So, um, and this goes to uh, whether it's a video or a podcast like we're doing today or a journal article or 
some kind of meeting or convening um, to be able to provide resources for people to um, to take these issues forward in their own work. So I go. I will go to the empower humanity issue. Um, this is as the foundation. Uh, under the 25th year of its life, this has, has become the central tenet actually guiding the work that we do. So as I said at the beginning, when I think about this, uh, this idea of empowering humanity, I think about um, three things. Living a dignified, what it means to empower humanity. It means to empower people to live a dignified life. Uh, to provide people with an opportunity uh, to live a life of high quality, mm -hmm. living standards are of high quality, and also giving people an opportunity to part to be part of an inclusive citizenship. So these are things that are you know fundamental elements of the work that we do as a philanthropic institution. The work that we do uh, every day around the globe addresses those very issues. We help people live a life of dignity. We have people to achieve a quality of life that is acceptable. And we also um, helping people to be included and benefit from um, all of these things that should be an um, automatic right um, of people who are part of a democratic society. That is education, um, health, culture, all of these issues. That's great. Um, we are great admirers of yours, uh, the work that you've done at the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, and in particular, the work that you've been doing on the concept of democracy. And I've noticed that one of your principal activities is the Nostos Conference that you've been convening for, I guess it's 10 years or more? More than that now. It's more eight. than that now. We're going into the 12th year actually this summer, this June. Congratulations. Having organized a few things like this in the past, I realized what a tremendous effort it takes, especially at the global scale that you, um, that you work on. So I wanted to use this opportunity though, to talk a little bit about the concept itself and the concept of Nostos. Um, to me, it's a very powerful idea, um, and I know it's informed all of these gatherings, and maybe you could just go back to sort of the origin moment for, for a minute and talk about why you're convening around that theme and that concept. Thank you, Joel. Let me, let me start by saying that um, this is a conference and a festival. It started with the conference and eventually it evolved into a week long uh, festival that includes the conference. It is a collaborative effort. A lot of people work very hard throughout the year in order to put this together within and outside the foundation. So Nostos um, entails the idea of homecoming and returning home. And it is very closely associated for most people uh, with Odysseus's efforts to uh, return back to Ithaca from uh, the war in, in Troy. But to me, is if one wants to look at it for, from a broader point of view, it's about seeking what is absent, seeking what is not there. And in organizing this conference, it is an attempt basically to seek and reimagine a public space a public space where people convene uh, and have a conversation about very critical issues. And at the same time, they try not so much to answer questions, but to raise more questions. I think this is the most um, important part of that conference. We don't claim that we have the answers, but what we want to do throughout this conference is to raise as many questions for the audience to contemplate. So it's seeking basically, again, uh, recreating a space, an open space where people can engage with each other, which is something that I believe is beginning to get to, to be a miss in our days. No, that's great. I want to come back to this, but maybe the next part of this conversation that would be helpful is to connect this to further work that you're doing around the concept of the Agora, right? Again, a, a Greek concept, um, which has provided sort of an organizing principle for, for, some of, for more of your work. So maybe you could connect the two a little bit. 
So the the idea of Agora of an open space where people again can engage with each other became very important to us as we as an organization uh, began to realize, and this is something that it's also promulgated by the foundation's co-president Andreas Trakopoulos, that polarization had become a very, very critical issue, had become an issue that basically was taking apart our societies. Um, and so we engaged in an effort to um, create spaces where the issue of polarization can be addressed or going back to the idea of the agora or agora in Greek mm -hmm. uh, to create a space where people can engage and disagree or agree with each other, but without being polarized. Mm -hmm. I think we have gotten away completely of that particular concept. The ability to have a conversation in which we hold the different opinions, but which ends up not taking us apart completely. What do you see as the biggest sort of challenges to that right now? Polarization okay. is one of them. Inequality is another one. The decline of public and civic institutions, the enormous distrust that exists uh, in the public about governments and about public institutions. Um, those are the main challenges that I see right now. Yeah, and so with that in mind, how do you think then about about addressing it from from where you are? Again, is it is it more sort of listening and responding? Or look, I uh, mean, a, a foundation yeah. cannot claim that they can address mm -hmm. these issues. You simply cannot. We cannot do mm -hmm. it on our own. Uh, this is something that it's it requires a, a long term effort, and this is something that requires a collaboration between private and public institutions and a collaboration with the broader public. So um, one cannot claim, I believe, that they can address this extremely complex issue on their own. By listening, I think, is the very first step. I know that one of the initiatives the foundation has been interested in and you've been interested in personally is the challenge of um, new technologies um, particularly artificial intelligence um, and the capacity of these new technologies to literally change the human experience in the way we think about um, our experience and what it even means to be human. Um, maybe you could share some of your ideas and some of your experiences in that, in that area. So I think the main issue here is who regulates these new technologies. Mm -hmm. They present a number of serious ethical questions. And right now, I do not believe that we have a framework through which we can address these issues and these questions. This is not something to be blamed on scientists and researchers. They move on their own pace and according to their own uh, schedules. Scientists and researchers in general, they're occupied with discovering things and we, they, they move from one discovery to the next. As they do that, they do not have the time or the frame of mind to contemplate what are the consequences for the public domain of the work that they're doing. And I'll give you one example. So, a solution had to be found, an answer had to be given uh, to the pandemic. People had to work really quickly and they have to put a lot of effort into figuring out a vaccine. They did not have time to contemplate what all this meant. And I'm not saying that there are many ethical questions here. I'm just saying, I'm just giving it as an example that you are pressed for time all that it matters to you is providing a solution to a very difficult problem. At the same time, there should be someone else and there should be a framework, a legal and institutional framework that begins to address as these things are happening, what are the legal ramifications and consequences of whatever is getting discovered, of whatever let's say evolution we are having on the scientific front, 
for the general public, for us as human beings, for governance, all of these things. There have to be uh, things put in place that at the same time are addressing these questions. This is not an issue that should concern scientists and researchers, in my view. Right, the ethics and governance framework question. Uh, they, right. they cannot do it. They just cannot do it and they should not be asked to do this. Right, and, and it would seem to me that there are more issues in front of us now, immediate issues right in front of us that uh, fall into this category. So you mentioned the pandemic, but you know clearly climate change would be um, in, that, in that area as well. Um, Artificial intelligence, as, as you mentioned, right. and a number of evolutionary discoveries uh, in, on, on the medical and biological front. We are coming right. upon <clears throat> things that they have the ability to alter radically who we are as human beings uh, and how society works. And there are right. numerous, numerous questions that relate to those. Uh, they have to do with who benefits from these discoveries, uh, how do we understand ahead of time of what the consequences would be, a number of different things that have right. to be addressed, or they have to be considered at least. Right. So where do you see the sort of process of sort of even just sharing of information and in perhaps leading to some global coordination around these issues where, I mean, it's not happening at the United Nations level, it doesn't seem to be. Um, does this need to be, um, does it need to, res to reside eventually at the United Nations level or yeah. does there need to be new, new mechanisms for, for sort of global, global coordination around these global scale challenges? I think there should be a mechanism if the United Nations is the mechanism that addresses these issues that can be debated. Many yeah. people can argue that this is an organization that cannot address such issues. So my answer to this is that we have to figure out an institutionalized way to address these questions. Uh, an institutionalized way that includes all of these different constituencies that are part of this, that are part or they should be part of this conversation. Again, is it the United Nations or something else or we recreate another institution? I don't know, I don't have the answer to that, but this is the only way to happen. And uh, we go back then to the public having the ability to assign trust to such to such an institution. I think the pandemic, it's a great example. Um, I don't necessarily want to talk about the pandemic a lot, although I wanted to mention a few things about pandemic and Nostos actually, and we have what we discussed before. But I think what we have seen is such an incoherent response uh, to the pandemic that raises these questions. It doesn't, there seem, it seems to be no institution right now. The World Health Organization should have been the one right. that manages to, to, put, to address this um, issue in a way that people trust and in a way that people agree to. So how, how do we re rebuild trust um, in institutions? What, what, what tools do we, do we have? Is this a leadership question? Is it a a question of new institutions that are needed? Um. I think it has to start with trusting governments mm -hmm. and trusting public institutions. And I believe, and this is my personal belief, that the Western world has gotten away from that. Mm -hmm. We tend to think that we tend to trust, we tend to believe more in the ability of the private sector to address such things. And we basically turn governments into a scapegoat. Mm -hmm. So unless we begin to reverse this trend, and unless we begin to rethink about governments as a way to address public issues, we're not gonna be able to do it. And that's the big issue that you have to trust that governments are in place to address th 
these difficult issues and that they can do so as they have done so traditionally. They have always played that role. They have always been able to take care of, of the weakest and to address such critical issues. Not any longer, they're not trusted to do so. Right. Um, you'd mentioned, so you'd mentioned some of these issues that came up in the context of Nostos with the pandemic. Did you want to elaborate? I, on I just that? wondered yeah. because one of the things that you had mentioned when we started talking is about, you know, why the concept of Nostos is very important now. And I think it's particularly important now, because if you look at this from the point of view of seeking what is absent, I think the pandemic uh, fits into this conversation perfectly because we are at a stage right now that we constantly seeking what we are missing and we are what we are missing is the lives that we had before the pandemic. Yeah. This is why the concept of Nostos is so relevant. This is what every single one of us is thinking right now. The pandemic has taken us away of things that we were con we took as given and standards and we are very nostalgic, although the word nostalgic can be interpreted in many different ways, but you know, we constantly want to go back into, if you want to use the, the term prelapsarian phase, that's, that's right. before the fall. That's we are, what we are looking for right now. And that's why Nostos right. is so relevant as a concept today. So, so I'll share with you what, you know, my thinking when I was thinking about Nostos coming into this conversation, the return home, and it, and it fits in with what you were saying about what was missing. Because to me, and I'll put on my sort of American citizen hat for a moment. When I think of returning home, what, what does that mean? It means the basic principles, which we, which at least in my, my life, I sort of took for granted in my lived experience in my intellectual formation. And those basic principles were, you know, were pluralism you know, e pluralis unum, right? We're, you know, out of many, one. Like that, that's what was to me distinct and exceptional about the United States, that, that, that we were multicultural or multi-ethnic or, but we were plural and that that's, that's what it was all about. Um, and that was a, a strength. And, you know, to me, that's returning home. <laughs> you know, that's basic to, to what it actually means. And it also happens to be perhaps missing. Uh, at the same time, but also the basic principles when we were talking about ethics, right? That what, what, the, what are the basic principles that we, we stand for? And for us, right, it was, it's rights, but of course rights are connected to responsibilities, right? And that, that, whole, that whole question, we used to have a rational framework to discuss these things. Uh, and that seems to be to be missing that rational, or at least it's in some jeopardy, that rational framework for, for uh, even agreeing to disagree about certain aspects of, of rights and responsibilities. Um, and then, uh, you know, and that's the, obviously the Declaration of Independence, right? That, that there's something we, we stand for. And then, and then of course, fairness, the constitution, which is again, that to me, that was always home. You know that we lived in a society that at least attempted um, some some notion again highly debated much discussed um, frequently uh, disagreed upon but but at least we were at least arguing about the same thing about what's fair and what's unfair and that we could create an arena for for all of this this to happen and so I suppose my nostalgia is is for that <laughs> that there were some identifiable principles. You're not the only one, actually. <laughs> there were some identifiable principles. And, um, you know, my, my concern now is the, the two, it's interesting what you said about government, so I'll come back to that. But um, there's concern, particularly in light of, of new technologies and new capacities on top of this environment you've described, there's the sort of capture, if you will, by by the, the you know um, technology um, and those behind it, those developing the, the idea that the commercial interests you know, are so overwhelming. Um, and in fact, it's similar to what you were saying about the vaccine. The people who are building these these uh, these algorithms or whatever, they're so busy doing it. You know, they may not be 
completely understanding the results of their work, right? But anyway, the sort of the commercial and, and also just the commercial pressure um, in that area. And then also um, on the government side, you know, yes, there is the sort of positive side. Governments should be earning our trust and, and, and be working in our interests. But of course, what, we, what we're seeing too is the idea that governments are capturing, you know, the, the sort of the capacities to, to sort of amass power and to gain power um, through new technologies and through the weakness of our civil society. And so when I'm thinking about ethics from Carnegie Council's perspective, you know, it's, we're going to need some response to these kind of the sort of the power side of it, right? The, 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 what, what governments are, are trying to do, but also what the commercial interests are trying to do, and there needs to be some answer, right? Um, so just some no, thoughts. I, share about, yeah. I, I absolutely agree with what you are saying. Yeah. Obviously, I mean, you, this is the, the focus of the work that you do and the institution does. I'm not an ethicist by any means or an expert, uh, but I think one of the problems we are facing today is we do not um, understand any longer uh, what ethical behavior is uh, and what it means to have ethical guidelines, specific ethical guidelines. And to me, this is the result of confusing morality with ethics. Mm -hmm. We are engaged in a conversation about morality, increasingly so, uh, and we are moving away uh, from a conversation about ethics. And these are completely different concepts and things. So to my mind, at least, when you talk about morality, you are dealing with subjective views and behavior. And when you are talking about ethics, you are dealing with objective views and behaviors. And it used to be the case that there was a very clear line demarcating the two. I don't think that exists any longer. And I think the conversation about all of these issues that we are having today, and not only the, you know, us here, but the world is having today, is a conversation that these issues are approached from a moral perspective rather than an ethical one. And that's where, you know, it gets much more muddled, the landscape, and much more difficult to address because you're beginning to, to talk about issues that are highly, highly subjective. Right, and that's why I sort of, for me, the cardinal principle for us is, is this concept of pluralism, because speaking to you, because if ethics is, is a sort of a process, right, of, um, of understanding, but then also beginning to weigh different um, options and trade-offs and also um, competing goods and sometimes irreconcilable goods that um, sort of for me the price of admission is pluralism which is you have to understand that to, to sort of to have a, a this this conversation and understand that it will be imperfect um, that it's not just yeah it's not a list it's not a list of moral principle these are the these are the commandments or these are the lists this is the checklist no it's a process of engagement discussion dialogue trade-off um, but you have to to me I think what's missing is the commitment to that right in the um, I agree and I yeah, think yeah. we're yeah. living in an era where we're paying tremendous attention you know to subjectivity and what is relevant and what is not relevant. And when, you know, and that, that is very, very difficult to, everything is subjective, everything is relevant. And so you have an open-ended conversation about everything and there are no standards, guiding right. standards, according to you, which you can go by on a number of different fronts. Oh, you know, you, how many times do you hear about every issue? Uh, this is, you know, uh, this is relevant here, but it's not there. You know, it's subjective to this or that or the other. We cannot live like this. There mm -hmm. are certain issues that they require, um, you know, guidelines that cannot be debated actually. There are you know, certain rules that are, that are acceptable to society uh, and we used to have them, I think, but we now right. are going away from them. We are thinking again, not as a whole, but as individuals. And you know, this is a trend and that's why we're getting into trouble. 
so this gets to the, the sort of the, the big point, which is um, embedded in the concept of pluralism is something, you, there is something universal in the human experience, right? And there is something common about being human. I think it gets to your point about universality, right? So I, I think of it in, in two, two ways. One is again, what's common about being human, but then also the universality of our, of our experience, right? We're, we're here together, uh, increasingly together. Um, and I do think the story of, of, this, of this century so far is that, that um, integration, if you will, common threats, whether it's pandemics or climates or AI or whatever. I mean, we're, we're being, the world is literally getting smaller in that sense. So you're right. I mean, we do need some, but, but people tend to back away from the idea of universal today. Well, how do you, I mean, how you think about that? Well, I th what I think is universal for human beings is a desire to form communities and to live yeah. close with each other. We know that, uh, and we also know that in order to be to do that, whether you want to name, call it democracy or whatever else you may choose to call it, it requires listening to the other. I'm one of these people who always thought that marriage or living with another human being was the ultimate democratic act from the yeah. point of view that you are coexisting with someone with whom you may have completely different approaches about every single issue, but you have to negotiate that space right. and coexist as a couple at the end of the day. I think we are getting away from that again, which is, I think, you know, um, ingrained into human beings to live together as communities. And that's, that's where we are beginning to have serious trouble. Yeah, so take us with that in mind. I'm curious to go back to, um, you know, your, your sort of intellectual formation and what got you into this, this business in the first place uh, and your study of, um, you know, classical philosophy. And, and so um, how, how does that inform your thinking today uh, in terms of these kinds of questions? And what do we need to sort of bring forward or bring into the foreground from, from that ancient world and, and apply it today? So I was, I was very privileged to have the opportunity to study with people that they were giants in their fields. And those were people that were very, very generous and gracious about sharing knowledge and about teaching. So that's, that's how it started for me. And then I was very privileged and lucky to come upon, although I have done things before I came to the foundation, to come um, upon the work of the foundation that uh, fitted my interest intellectually, but also appealed to me tremendously from the point of view of doing things for the common good. I think the most important lesson in relation to this conversation, because the classical work can provide uh, points for discussion about every single item and topic, is that I would go back to Aristotle's um, concept of what it means to be a political being. Political not in the way that we understand politics today, but as being part of the police, of the group, of the many. That is the most important lesson that we can take from, from the classics when it comes to this particular uh, issue of creating a public space and um, creating the opportunity to have an open conversation and an open debate. We have to understand that we are part of the many we are not living in isolation and we have lost this concept of what it means to be a politicos under as a political being actually we've lost we have no concept of this today this very idea that i work at a place where all i do every day is how i can figure out how to help in the most effective way um, those who are most in need and what can I do to benefit the general public to me is such a privilege. And I don't have to worry about raising the money to do so. All I have to do is think about how can I do that? So to me, that's, that's a tremendous uh, privilege and 
has formed the way that um, that I think about things on an every on an everyday uh, level. The, the the questions that we're facing today are universal questions. These are questions that have have occupied human beings forever. I am not going to be one of these people that says that we have to go back to the classics. This is the only answer to everything. Blah blah blah. I don't believe that. But what I believe is that humanity is not a linear march forward. Mm -hmm. The way history works is cyclical. What is happening today, we have seen before. This idea of constant progress is a dream. It's a delusion where the world is not working that way. And so we have to go back. We have to go to the past and see how people addressed certain issues before but we also have to understand how people thought about these issues before us and what kind of answers were given and the intellectual process that went into addressing these issues that's the only way we can understand what is happening today and that that is the only way that we can begin to think about addressing today's issues in the best way possible. We have to understand how people thought about these things before us. And I would leave it at that. I'm not, again, I'm not yeah. gonna say that unless we go back to Homer or Plato right. or Aristotle. Right. And there are many, many debates right. about what those people said you know, uh, today. But the important thing is that we understand, again, how thinkers throughout time have contemplated these issues because there's so much we can learn from that process and we tend not to do so it's the yeah. our time is the time of the now is the time of the spectacle is the time of the 10 minutes attention span or much less than 10 minutes that's it we don't tend to go back everything moves forward everything changes constantly so this idea of looking back or what has been accumulated in terms of knowledge is something that we not um, we do not aspire to any longer. That was the question I was going to ask, which is: it seems that this is not something that's valued in society today. Um, the you know the even just looking at the state of the humanities um, in the university world, but um, even broader and just in civil society. Um, we do have robust cultural institutions, they, they still exist. But again, in terms of energy, in terms of value, um, they seem to be devalued. And, and you think this is just the, where we are, it's just the, the spirit of the age or? Uh, no, I think, yeah. I think um, is the direct outcome of new technologies that we are engaging yeah. with, yeah. internet, you know, our phones, smartphones, all of these technologies, they are conducive to um, constantly living in the minute. And also they have taken away the ability to congregate. Again, this idea of a public space where we congregate right. in order to discuss things, in order to agree or disagree vehemently actually, but be able to do so has gotten away, completely away. Uh, we agree and disagree in digitally, but I don't think it's the same. It is not the same because you never think when you do that digitally, who is across, who is sitting across from you. You, ne you are never thoughtful, you're just reacting. you constantly, constantly reacting because you want to get something out there because that's what it matters having your voice being out there, not what you are saying, but your mere presence is what right. is valued. Nobody right. cares what everybody else says, because, you know, I mean, you look at Twitter, how much can you keep up with devices like this? So it's all about who posted something, not about what they posted necessarily, but keep posting, 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 posting. It's the modus vivendi of our times. Yeah. I do not think that the internet constitutes a public square. I do not. Um, 
and um, I can I can bring forward many many examples why I do not believe that. I am basically one of these people that has you know that abides by what Jane Jacobs, the the great urbanist, said about neighborhood corners being the absolutely most democratic spaces that have ever existed. And it used to be that at a neighborhood corner in a diverse neighborhood, people who congregate disagree completely with each other, make a lot of noise, fight, blah, 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 but essentially come to a conversation that cannot exist today any longer. That idea of a public space has disappeared. We have to have only organized public spaces, which is a very, very, very different concept. Um, I think the internet is it's a cacophony of voices. It's not a public space. Again, uh, we tend to think because we can express any opinion we want that this constitutes a public space, but it's not. It's just uh, a monologue by everybody that is involved in these things. And I remember when the Arab Spring was happening, the conversation about whether or not the, the internet had empowered that whole movement. And I was struck by how misguided people were in relation to that, that because you had the ability to gather people together that meant that this can be a sustained reaction to what they were trying to react to. Just because you can send messages and say to people, gather at Tahir Square at 5 a.m., it does not mean necessarily that you can create a movement. You need something completely different. So that's what I think about the public space, the internet public space today. I think we are ascribing powers to it that they do not exist. Again, coming back to the library, sort of a radically democratic concept in the sense of that it, it gives access to every person, access to knowledge. And why is this important? Is because it enables every, it empower, literally empowers every person to think for him or herself, right? And to me, this is the basis. This is the the fundamental building block. It has to go along with the culture that you're describing, Stelios, which is you know, one of mutual respect and dialogue. And I mean, that's all comes with it, but the, but the essential element is that capacity uh, for human beings to, to, both, to both express, first of all, to learn, um, but then also to express. Um, and, and sadly, it seems to be vanishing. You know, you've spoke very, very eloquently of the need to be open and the need to be inclusive and the need to be diverse. And this is this is the spirit of our age. This is what's happening right now. There is a leveling um, well overdue of, you know, the equal regard for every person, the equal regard for every human being and their voice and so on. Um, along with that, though, a society does need you know, leadership, right? It needs it needs the 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 people who have uh, accomplished, who have learned, um, and who will use that learning in a way that will help um, society along. Anyway, there's no real answer to this question, but I, I feel like this is part of what we're looking at right now, um, uh, and part of this distrust equation. Curious if you have any thoughts about. Yes, I, I think we are in a moment where there is a leadership gap, and this is not in relation to the US only, but this is in relation, I mean, this relates globally. It's, you know, we seem not to be able to find the types of leaders that we need today. Uh, and when I think about leadership, I think people who can lead by example. Mm -hmm and people who understand what it means to be decisive, because that is what is required about, um, you know, when you are in a leadership position today. And we have gotten completely away from that very concept. I always think when I think about leadership, and I often think about it, I think about Alexander the Great and the, and the Gordian knot. When he comes upon the knot and he has to solve it, he gets the sword out and basically destroys it. So this is the type of decisiveness that is required in critical moments. And this is the type of decisiveness that we do not see uh, manifested in the leaders of today. 
and um, and of course, then we go to the issue of trust. There is no trust any longer, and there is no trust that um, leaders are serving the common good. There's no such trust. They are always seen as serving their own private interests or the interests of the private sector, and that's very damaging. There's yeah, no well, frenesis among our leadership. <laughs> no time to think about these things. No time at all. Well, if anything, no wisdom. Get... We spoke about the fact that um, as change, technological change and technological innovation is happening, there is no time from the scientist point of view, actually, that's how we started for them to stop, think carefully and contemplate what would be the consequences of what they're inventing. It seems also to be the case that it's not only the scientists that are not doing that, society in general collectively does not have the time, the attention span, or let me put it uh, in a different way, uh, the will to be able to do so. Phronesis means basically um, a careful, consideration, a wise consideration of things, not rushed, not tempestuous, not sentimental, not emotional. It implies a certain type of wisdom and wiseness, which I think is completely absent from the conversation that we're having about the impact and the uh, significance of all these new technologies. The reaction that we are having is a knee-jerk reaction. We need the technologies, we use them where we feel, but there's not, there's no phronesis about it. There's no careful yeah. consideration and, but that careful consideration is practical. It has it has practical value, and this is the part that that's um, can be frustrating because um, oftentimes the ethics questions or the values questions or the societal they get put aside as opposed to being seen as intrinsic. That that the actual has that it has intrinsic and practical applied value um, to the system. <laughs> as opposed to, well, it's an effect of the system or it's downstream of the system, or we worry about that later, that it's that it's intrinsic. And this to me seems to be exactly what's missing. That that th these questions are sort of dismissed. They're not in because they're not engineering questions and they're not uh, implementation questions. They're, they're sort of second order questions, if you will, where it's they a, should yeah, be. I mean, the idea of fronts is an idea of process, basically. How yeah. do you contemplate critical issues. That's what it is all about. What is the process that you need to apply in order to be able to, to deal with issues that A, are very complex, mm -hmm. and B, they have the potential to radically alter not only us as human beings, but what is happening around us and how societies work. So that very process of care, careful deliberation of careful thinking on carefully considering everything that relates to these things and everything that has happened around us, that very process is not in place right now uh, when we are having a conversation about where are we going with these new technologies. It's absent, it's completely absent. Yeah, I mean, if nothing else, we can provide a kind of a counter narrative. I, I agree with you, Stelios. I mean, all my work has been in, as a realist. You know, I think of myself as you a have to be as a realist. So, but I, so I start there. But I still, I you know, I think there's still a case, and we we can't give up a case to be made on realist grounds uh, to go back to again, you know, common values, common interests, and. You know, I'm not, uh, this is not a religious thing and this is not a, you know, no, no, I mean, realistic thing. It's just, this is a, this is a survival thing. And it's a, it really is basically my understanding of ethics is, you know, 
it's just it's just basic life it's it's basic health right it's just how to live you know and, 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 and that's so, i mean you're yeah. absolutely right and that's the the essence of that word phronesis yeah. is you know yeah. practical wisdom you know yeah. uh practical approach to things practical yeah. virtue we've you know we've gone away from these things we don't you know we don't seem to see them from a practical perspective but yeah, that's the story. Another for in a conversation for another time is how and why it just sort of van. It, the, the other thing is sort of vanished, and 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 again, from my perspective, vanished so quickly. To me, just it was almost uh, you can almost look at the middle of the last decade. It just you know, it, it sort of we tapped on the glass and it just broke. That's maybe you see it differently, Stelios, but to me, it was quite sudden. But maybe I was sleepwalking a little bit too long myself. But, uh, well, I mean, we don't we don't have, you know, the ability, I think, to and again, we shouldn't yeah. and, you know, to detect patterns early enough yeah. because we are so consumed with what is happening around us every day that we can re not really see those patterns. And that addresses the other term that you use, yeah. Anja, it's And, you know, if again, if we can stop and deliberate and think carefully, perhaps we we can at least certain parts sometimes you know you have to wait 10 15 years in order to be able to have a complete picture of what is happening but again we're not thinking at all in those in those terms i think you know we don't we don't seek patterns at all yeah it's a sound bite and moving forward and moving to the next thing as quickly as we can and yeah. you're right it's it just it seems to us that it happened suddenly again yeah. The best of people, the most brilliant of people, are the people who are the most generous with their with their thoughts and their knowledge. Yeah. The very mediocre people were the ones who were guarding their knowledge as if it was something that it was so special. And it wasn't because they were mediocre. The yeah. other ones actually wanted to throw things out at you so that they can hear what you had to say. Yeah. Yeah. And start a conversation which helps them discover other things as well. That's the. This is my experience. Thing. This was wonderful. Yeah. We'll, we'll find a way to continue this conversation. For please, sure. please. Wow. This has truly been a fascinating conversation with lots of fodder for further thought. Thank you so much, Delios and Joel, for sharing your thoughts and insights. Thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in. And a special thanks to the team at the Carnegie Council for hosting and producing this podcast. For the latest content on ethics and international affairs, be sure to follow us on social media at Carnegie Council. My name is Anya Kasperson, and I hope we earned the privilege of your time. Thank you.